Good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Come on, somebody, right where you're at in your bedroom, while you're driving in your car, in your living room, everybody, all the saints, we have just a few of our essential and a few members here at the sanctuary. We're so thankful and so grateful for each and every one of you who've taken the time this Sunday morning to commune with us, to fellowship with us, that we might worship together. Amen. Giving God glory on this morning, honoring him, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And honoring our pastor, Dr. Alton Park Sr. Amen. Bless you, sir. Each and every one of our ministerial staff, our elders and ministers, each of our deacons, we just honor each and every one of you all, even those who aren't here, those who we haven't seen. We still honor you and the position that God has placed you in. We're so thankful and grateful again just to be with you all um, one more Sunday. Amen. And on today, we just want to remind you all before I dive into the word a few things. This coming Wednesday, you all are used to, of course, seeing her in Sunday school because she's the Sunday school superintendent. But this week on Wednesday at 6 p.m., you can tune in to Bible study and our very own minister, Joy Barnett, amen, will be bringing the lesson. So tune in on Facebook, call in via the call line, however you want to get connected with us. We pray that you will if you're free from your responsibilities at that time, Wednesday at 6. Tune in, because as always, God does use this preacher, and she can preach and teach, and I'm confident that she will be a blessing to you. Amen. And then another announcement is coming. We got a couple weeks left, everybody. First Sunday in April. Amen, somebody. First Sunday in April, we are opening the doors of the church for you to come on in. That's going to be every first Sunday. So come this coming first Sunday of April. And we ask that when you come, please, ma'am, please, sir, do wear your mask. Please, ma'am, please, sir, if you have the vaccine, if you've been vaccinated, you have taken all the necessary precautions, whether it's one or two shots, please do let us know. Be prepared again with your mask. Uh, you will have questionnaires at the door. So be patient with us. Don't only bring your praise, your worship, and your prayers, but bring your patience. Amen. But please do, ma'am. Please do, sir. Come and join us. We're so excited. Um, I've been able to come every Sunday for media, but it's not the same when you can't fellowship. Amen. So I'm excited. Even though I've been here, I'm excited to see your face. So come. Even if you haven't, maybe you join Samaritan. You, you started partnering with us during this virtual time. We'd be happy to see you for the very first time. So we invite you to come and join us here in a couple weeks on Sunday at 9 a.m. for Sunday school and at 10 a.m. for worship. Amen. Am I forgetting anything? I think I got everything. I think I did. Amen. We praise God for our pastor again just for giving us the opportunity to exercise our gifts to practice and what we've been called to do in our preaching. So at this time, before I even read a scripture or anything, I'm just going to ask each and every one of you to pray with me. Gracious and kind God, we honor you, we thank you, we praise you for your goodness, your mercy, your love and kindness towards us, Lord God, for your faithfulness, Lord God, that you never leave or forsake us, Lord God. We come right now just asking you, Lord God, to anoint your preacher, God, to have your way, Lord God, in my words, in my heart, Lord God, and in my mind. That your word might be preached with power and with conviction to the salvation of souls and the edification of your body, Jesus. We thank you for the blood. And we ask, Lord God, that you would cleanse us, Lord God, your preacher and your listeners of your word, that we might not only preach your word, but receive your word, and there in processing your word to walk it out. That it wouldn't only stay in our head, but it would seep through to our heart. 
We praise you and we thank you for getting the glory out of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to ask that you would open it. You're going to have two scriptures on today. We'll be reading from the New King James Version. You can read from whatever version you have. The New King James Version is closest to the King James Version, but also, in my opinion, easier for us to understand than the King James Version. So that's why I use it, that it could be closer to the most traditional and also easy for us to understand. We're going to be in Isaiah 57, the 57th chapter, verse 15. And we're also, after we finish at Isaiah 57 and 15, we'll move to Psalms 51 and 17. Our main text will be Isaiah 57 and 15. So make sure if you only have one bookmark, you place it there. Again, I'm reading from the New King James Version. That's Isaiah 57 and 15 in Psalms 51 and 17. If you're there, it will sound something like this. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Turn your Bible over to Psalms 51 and 17. It says there, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Amen. The word is already blessed. Um, if you can turn to yourself or turn to your family member, whoever is next to you, and advise them, you need to take a break. Amen. Tell somebody, take a break. Now, I pray that you all don't stone me, don't throw your phones, don't hang up on the phone, don't stop your your Facebook live tweet on today, don't get mad at me. I am just the messenger. Amen. I'm just the messenger. And I pray you tuned in for Sunday school because if you did, it might make this word a little more easy for you to take. In the book of Isaiah, the first of the four major prophets of the Old Testament, it is commonly split into two by scholars. In the first 39 chapters, uh, it's commonly referred to as the Assyrian period. The prophet Isaiah declares the Lord's indictment against his people and the judgment that they would soon face. The second half in chapters 40 through 66, it's referred to as the Babylonian period. It covers an exhortation and promise and prophecy of hope and salvation that will help strengthen and sustain God's people, the Jewish people, through Babylonian captivity. But God, in his supreme wisdom, as he always does, he didn't just provide these words that are written here in Isaiah to give Israel and Judah encourage and strength. No, here in the text, Uh, On the other side of the promise and the prophecy of the Messiah, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we can still, even today, find strength and assurance in this holy scripture. Interestingly, in chapter 57, where our text is found, it mirrors the book of Isaiah and its structure of opening and indictment and closing in hope and salvation. Our scripture of focus, Isaiah 57 and verse 15, is found in the second half of the chapter that was written to give us hope of that salvation. And yet, here in the text, we find that the God of our salvation dwells with the seemingly hopeless. The text says, for thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit 
Many scholars, many scholars, they find themselves in a perpetual pendulum of paradox because God is saying, to paraphrase, uh, I dwell in the highest of heavens with the broken and lowly. He says, again, this is to paraphrase, I dwell in the highest of heavens with the lowly. See, the scholars who deal with this text, they have a problem with God saying that he's in two places um, in one sentence. And we tend to have a problem as believers with the description of the words that God chose to use, um, not the places that he chose to dwell, because we uh, we were taught, if you're a believer, that God is omnipresent, meaning that he can be in more than one place at one time. See, most of us don't have a problem where, with where God is saying he is. Most of us have a problem with God dwelling with or making his presence with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Most of us have a problem for one or two, one of two reasons. One, we don't know what contrite means. Or two, uh, we know what it means, but we don't like the idea of being contrite or the idea of being humble, if we to be honest. Many of us as believers, church, are deficient of God's presence in our lives because of pride. Many of us are deficient of God's presence, even as believers, Pastor, because of idolatry. And some of us are just deficient of God's presence because of lack of understanding. Or even as the Bible says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm so glad you asked. You can pray. Five times a day, you can read four chapters of the Bible, meditate for three hours, and give two to two churches, all for one simple reason, your pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too many of us are more concerned with how we sound and how we look, and God is more concerned with the condition of our heart. Maybe, maybe that's not you. Maybe, maybe you don't care how you look. You don't care what people think about you. You don't care how you sound to people. Maybe you're focused on your business because you're building an empire. Or maybe you're focused on your investments uh, uh, because you're trying to create generational wealth. Uh, maybe you might just be focused on your job because you're determined to get that promotion. And summer's right around the corner. Maybe you're focused on getting your beach body so you can find a new man. And maybe that new man will put a ring on it and... Focus on making you happy because, you know, happy wife, happy life, right? That's what they say. Or maybe you just focused on getting your kids through and to college because you just want them to have more than what you have. Most of us strive for those things, and those things aren't bad, Pastor. They, they're, not, they're not bad things. Most of those things are great things for us to focus on. But if I can, they're out in Facebook, give you just a little secret. Anytime you put your focus over your faith, we call that idolatry. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one or despise the other. And far too many times, many of us are putting our pride and our focuses before God, and we wonder why his presence isn't dwelling with us, why his presence isn't with us when we pray, why God's presence isn't in our worship, why his presence isn't with us when we sing praises, why God's presence isn't with us when we preach and when we teach and when we serve. If I could give you some advice, if you want God to dwell with you, cast down your crown and take a break. Somebody saying, you show enough preaching in the spirit, I've been wanting to take a, a vacation for a while now, 
But that's not the kind of break that I'm talking about. If we go to our text, God says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. The reason God isn't dwelling with you is because your spirit isn't conducive to his presence. Well, uh, preacher, why are you telling me that I need to take a break? I'm glad you asked. Remember I said some of us don't know what the word contrite is, and some of us just don't like it. Uh, we all know that to be humble is to be low, right, and to not be puffed up. But the word contrite literally means broken in pieces or crushed. It's not, that's not a pleasant word to us. That's not a pleasant word to our flesh, but it is the word. It means to be crushed. And I can hear you typing with your Twitter fingers on Facebook. I can hear you trying to throw the keyboard. Please, man, please, sir, don't hang up on me. Don't end the Facebook live tweet. Don't end the Facebook live feed. This word is for you. I'm not saying that God wants you to be financially broke, and I'm not saying that God wants you to be broke emotionally. No, God forbid. I used to wonder, church, why uh, many believers would walk around with their heads uh, down, with their shoulders hanging low, uh, with frowns on their faces like God hadn't done anything for them at all, but a lot of times these weren't just the ones that weren't lifting their hands in praise and worship. A lot of times these were the same people who had exuberant praise, who had exuberant, vibrant worship, but when the worship was over, they flip and have a frown. The smile that they gave God would be turned upside down right after the worship, and I wondered why this was, and I came to learn that some people just misinterpret the scripture. The Bible says, him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Yeah, uh, God cares about your body and he cares about your physical well-being. But more importantly, God is concerned with our hearts. He's concerned about your spirit, man. They say a hard head makes a soft you know what, but I'm here to tell you a hard head is just a sign of a hard heart. And the truth of the matter is a hard head and a hard heart both can be broken. Church, church, we need to position ourselves under the weight of God's word and under the weight of God's glory that we might be crushed. Your prayer today should change to God, break my pride. Break my selfishness. Lord, I need you to crush the idolatry in my life. And please, oh God, if you do one last favor, I need you to crush my will. The truth of the matter, Facebook, is that many of us are already broken, but we're broken in the wrong kinds of ways. We're broken physically, but we won't listen to a doctor or a nutritionist. We have emotional and psychological fractures and breaks, and we won't go see a therapist or a psychologist. But can I be real with you for just one moment? Uh, we've normalized dysfunction for far too long. In most cases, when you normalize something, you're conforming it to a standard or societal norms. I told you if you tuned in this morning for Sunday school, it would hurt a little less. Um, this week, earlier this week, I, I, was, I was listening to the news and they were talking about a tweet that a young man, he's a pop star, many of you may have heard of him, his name is Lil Nas X, he said uh, it's time we normalize weddings without the bondage of being with someone for the rest of your life. Now, 
as a believer, I have all types of problems and issues with that statement, but the one that I'm focusing on right now for this word is the word normalizing. The reason I focus on the word normalizing is because the world has been normalizing spiritual pride and idolatry, and in far too many cases, the church has been taking its cues from the world instead of taking its commands from God. And now we find ourselves showing up to Sunday worship, and God's presence is nowhere to be found. We want God's presence, but we don't want to do things God's way. We want to do things our way. And I'm here to tell you that God is a jealous God, and it won't work. If we really want God's presence, I beg you, I plead with you, my brothers and my sisters, crush everything sitting on the throne of your heart, and please take a break. We need God. We don't just need his blessings to rain down, but we need his presence. I love the song, Pressing Your Presence, but can I tell you just a, another little secret? Uh, some places in God, you can't press your way into. Uh, some places in God, you have to break into. Yeah, some places you can't press into, you have to break into. Too many times we try to press our way to a place and God asking him to take us higher. But if we heed the word carefully, he says, I dwell in the high and holy place. And the high and holy place is only high and holy because of his presence. God isn't asking us to climb up Jacob's ladder. He wants to meet you right where you're at. How do you know, preacher? Just how I know everything that I say over this pulpit, I go to the word. In Revelations 3 and 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he doesn't say, I'll call you out. Revelations 3 and 20, you can read it for yourself. Jesus, uh, the, the king of kings, Jesus, the Lord of lords, doesn't say, uh, uh, come out uh, 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 of where you at. Uh, he says, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Can I help you? How do you make pressure? Pre uh, preparations to dine with the Holy One. How do you make preparation and dine with the King of Kings? Well, if we look back to the Old Testament, any time the priest met with God, he prepared a sacrifice. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to bring a bull. You don't have to bring a lamb. As a matter of fact, close your pocketbook. You don't have to bring no money. My Bible says in Psalms 51 and 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, oh God, you will not despise. All I'm trying to tell you is that if you want his presence, you need to take a break. Break your pride, your will, and your idolatry on the altar of your heart. Before I go to my seat, church, I have some good news for you. Jesus has never been presented with something that's broken that he could not fix. The Bible says he asked the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to be made whole? And after 38 years of brokenness, that man, after obeying the words of Christ, took up his bed and he did walk. If you read Matthew and 15, uh, you'll find out that Jesus went up on a mountain near the Sea of Galilee and they brought to him the lame, the blind, the mute, and the maimed, all of them. Uh, they didn't just put the people in Jesus' face. Guess where they put them, y'all? They put the people at Jesus' feet. Y'all not hearing me. Um, you don't only need to come to Jesus with a contrite heart, but you need to come in low. 
you need to come in humble. Too many times, I know the Bible says that we ought to come boldly before the throne of grace, but we come boldly to the right place at his feet. Because when we come to God's feet, it's us recognizing our unworthiness. It's us not coming in pride, but recognizing that God has the supreme authority. That God is in control. That's how we bow down and the altar on our heart. Come to his feet. This is my word to you. Humble yourself, church, and take a break. There's a nursery rhyme that goes a little like this that most of you probably know. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's man couldn't put Humpty together again. Humpty was met by the king's man, but Humpty never met the king. Nursery rhymes are cool, church, but I, I, like, I like gospel music. And Tamla Mann, she said it best. She said, take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn, what? In pieces. This is my offering. Do you want to be made whole? I promise you, if you give God your pieces, he'll give you peace. If you'll crush your will, he'll give you his. And let me tell you, church, it's good to be in his will. Because when you're in his will, you're in his will. Y'all not hearing me? I'm talking about a, a divine inheritance. Joy unspeakable. Unspeakable joy. Peace beyond understanding. You can wipe your tears because there'll be no more crying and no more gnashing of teeth unspeakable joy now I don't know about you but every day at work I take a break every day in this life saints you ought to take a break or two when you take a break give them your pride when you take a break give them your stubbornness when you take a break crush your idols when you take a break crush your jealousy I'm here to invite you to take a break and crush your pride. My prayer is that this word won't fall on deaf ears. That you won't get caught in a catchy phrase, take a break, but that you would actually take a break. This isn't something that you do when you come to Christ. This is something you do after you've come to Christ. This isn't something you do, you don't take a break and then you're done. Even in this sanctuary, each and every day, not just in worship, we need to come to God humbly. Broken and crushed in spirit. Because of our sins. As long as we're in this flesh, we'll have to crush this flesh. Jesus is knocking at the door. Maybe you've been broken, but you've never made, been made whole because like Humpty Dumpty, you've never met the king. I'm here to tell you on today, today is your day. The truth of the matter is, Jesus was crushed. Jesus lived a perfect life. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He lived a perfect, sinless life. 
a perfect selfless life. And after all of that living in that short time frame, At the end of the story, which for you and me is the beginning of the story, he was crushed. If you don't know him, I need you to know the son of God took nails in his hands. He put, they put a spike in his feet. They put a crown of thorns around his head. They pierced him in his side. He hung his head and died. He did it for you and me. Jesus was crushed that you might be made whole. 